but thanks for coming. So, as uh, I've been saying, the topic of our book is Resolving Plantar Fasciitis. Um, this is probably about three years in production, and uh, I don't know how many rewrites we've gone through, probably about ten. Uh, it's amazing, Kelly is, uh, I'm still living in the same house right now. But, uh, <laughs> we have put a lot of work into it, and we're very proud of the production. I think it turned out really well. Okay, so some of the hallmarks of this condition are severe pain upon rising in the morning. First thing you put your foot on the floor, it really hurts. You can barely put your foot down. And people notice as the day progresses that the pain gets a little bit better. Some of the classic signs and symptoms of this are pain on the inside of the center of the heel, but it can actually occur anywhere, front, back, side. And this is something that's kind of interesting because with this diagnosis, a lot of things get crammed into, I would call it almost like a garbage bag diagnosis in some ways. Because there's a lot of different syndromes that get put into one area. Uh, there could, for example, be pain along what we call a nerve pathway. So certain areas of the foot, whether it's inside, outside, they're very distinct in terms of what we call neurological pain. But not every case, but some of the cases. And another thing that's really important is for a lot of people who suffer from this condition, they may have ankle, knee, hip, back pain, associated pain. And this is such a common thing because they don't realize there's even a correlation between what's going on in their feet and other areas of the body, or other areas of the body causing their foot pain. Now what's really interesting about this condition, it gets really interesting when you consider who gets it. Because it's not just people who are really active. Yes, runners, dancers, people that are hiking, triathletes, a number of people, but also sedentary individuals. So somebody who's sitting down and not really doing too much, they're going to get this condition also. Male, female, young, old. So you have to say, okay, so what's going on here? Why is there such a cross-section of different people? In fact, about 10% of the population will get this at some point in your life. So Calgary here, 1.3 million, we're talking about 130,000 people. That's a lot of people who get this condition. Very common. So we look at possible causes, and we can look at the soft tissue, soft tissue restrictions. Soft tissue, I mean muscles, ligaments, tendons, uh, connective tissue in the body. Restrictions that form in this, which could be from repetitive motion, it could be from uh, trauma, there's a number of different things that could cause it. And as we get restrictions in areas, Sometimes we'll get nerve compression in an area. And this could cause abnormal motion patterns. All of these things could lead to a problem. <laughs> Other things which people have commonly relate to this condition are things like shoes or um, mechanisms for shock absorption change with the shoes that we wear. Heels look great, but they don't have to do a heck of a lot in terms of our shock absorption mechanisms. Also, poor hip strength or poor core stability. Uh, they say that uh, sitting is a new smoking for good reason. A lot of people actually deactivate their hips. And in our society, um, well, Charlie here and Paula, they're great uh, salsa dancers, and they have very strong hips because they actually know how to activate their hips. But for the majority of us in the society, if you actually test hip strength and you have to do certain uh, exercises, it's, it's very poor overall. And this is also related to this condition. So we have to ask ourselves, what's going on here? And this is kind of an interesting thing because there's a lot of disagreement in the medical community. And some people will say there's an inflammatory problem here. Other people say it's not inflammatory. Some people will say, well, it's uh, a superficial problem. The plantar fascia is actually an area where the connective tissue goes from the toes to the heel, very superficial. And yet when I get in there and I palpate it, or somebody else palpates it, we'll see that it's not even tender. And we'll get in a little bit deeper, it may be a little sore, or it may not be. Different layers of tissue, superficial, intermediate, and deep. When we start getting really deep into this tissue, we see that, okay, this area is quite often affected, but not in everyone. So there's huge variation in terms of which areas are affected in the body. Some people say, oh, I've got a problem with heel spurs. And they'll see it on x-ray. And yet, we can treat these people, and we'll see big heel spurs on there. All their signs and symptoms will go away completely. They'll be totally functional. They can go back running. They can do marathons, all sorts of things and yet we re them, and the, the heel spurs haven't changed. So is that the problem? Probably not. What are heel spurs? Yeah. Uh, basically your heel or the calcaneus, you'll see some kind of like a projection of bone that sticks out from you. Quite often the soft tissue will get really tight, contracted, and where the particular muscles connect into the heel bone, this, the outside of the bone, the periosteum, 
it'll start to pull away from that and it can create a, 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 a projection of bubble. Okay. One thing they can agree on though is a degenerative hypothesis. We know that there's tissue changes that take place at a cellular level. Sometimes things thicken up, sometimes the tissue changes. And this we can agree on. So we kind of have to turn to Sheldon for a little advice here. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, don't you think if I were wrong, I'd know it, which is kind of an interesting perspective. Because when you talk to medical practitioners, you know, there's a huge array of perspectives on this condition. And a lot of them disagree with each other. Uh, what we do know is that uh, a wide range of people suffer from this condition, inactive and active. We know that uh, there are degenerative changes that take place. So, if we went from this perspective here, we'd say, well, what do I do with this condition? What is it that I can actually, how can I actually come up with a reasonable way of addressing this condition? And that's what we've basically done with this book. But to do that, we have to consider what is needed to resolve plantar fasciitis. So there's three things. We have to address what we call the myofascial system, the kinetic chain, and a concept called tensegrity. Okay. So the myofascial system, myo refers to muscle, fascia refers to the connective tissue of the body. Now, it's a really interesting thing because um, in terms of traditional books on anatomy, we look in a book, we see all the separate muscles, we see the divisions between different areas. And talking to different, um, remember I was talking, I was at Frey University in Amsterdam. And I was talking to one of the chancellors of the university there who has been teaching medicine for years, and I was talking to him and he says, you know, Brian, um, anatomical books, they're really a fantasy. Because in order for the muscles to look like this, we have to remove a tremendous amount of connective tissue. And we're basically uh, giving the idea that we have a muscle here, a muscle here, a muscle here, but all of these are connected together completely. And fascia is not just a packing material. It's a really interesting talk this one neurosurgeon gave. He goes, I'm gonna basically tell you all the damage I've done over the last 30 years. Because I didn't understand the importance of fascia. Uh, these conferences on fascia are really leading edge and uh, now we're getting maybe about 1,200 scientists from all over the world. And uh, when I first started going, I just thought, who are these people? They're coming up with this information and I realized some of these people are actually up for Nobel Prizes in their work and I said, well, maybe they don't know what they're talking about. <laughs> okay, so fascia is everywhere, it connects everything to everything. And what's really interesting, we think of a lot of neurological receptors and muscles, what, how our muscles are controlled, but the connective tissue that surrounds it there's actually more neurological receptors in that tissue than the actual muscles, which is pretty wild. So fascia controls movement. And a general concept, we think of when I go to school and they talk about an origin insertion of the muscle, belly of the muscle contracts and we get motion. In reality, to perform a motion, multiple structures, multiple muscles actually contract. And only portions of those muscles contract. That's all controlled by fascia. We haven't known that for that long. So what we have to do is we have to come up with a different way of looking at things. We can say that we've got 600 different muscles in the body, or we can say there's only muscle, one muscle and exists within 600 fascial pockets. A very different way of looking at that. Mm. The next concept is in terms of what uh, we call the kinetic web. And when I was saying how things are connected together, uh, there's a gentleman, uh, Thomas Myers in anatomy trains, and he's done some amazing dissections through the body. And what they do is they actually try to leave intact all the connections. So when they do a dissection out, they don't just say the separate muscle and dissect it out. They would look at what we call the posterior line. Now, we could literally dissect out the connections between the bottom of the foot, Achilles tendon, the calf muscles, the gastroc soleus, hamstrings, up into the muscles of the back, the rectus spine, and the top of the head. Now, if I was to pull on a sheet at one end here, obviously it's going to tighten all the way up. So what I'm saying is that everything is connected. So if we have a problem in the calf muscle, which is very, very common with people with plantar fasciitis, we have a problem in the foot. Of course, if we have a problem in the hamstring, it's going to affect everything in the foot. We can't separate these things. So in other words, there's a cascading effect in an injury. Something happens in one area, it affects another area. Local issues cause global problems. Now, I just showed you the, the posterior line. There, but there's lines throughout the entire body in terms of, been, these are actually, can be dissected out. I was thinking of actually putting a dissection video in here, but I thought, no, <laughs> 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 The dissection videos are easy to find on the navigation. 
very easy to find, and they're great too. And actually, Thomas Myers has some new ones out. The old ones are a little grainy, but some of the new ones he puts out are, are amazing. Yeah, great videos. Yeah, I have a lot of respect for Thomas Myers. But if we're looking at the interesting thing, he says too that you know these are just lines that he has actually dissected out, but in reality, we could actually dissect out other lines. So everything is completely connected. He himself will will say. Uh, Everything anterior posterior connects together to form one web or a mesh of connective tissue. And this is the concept of tensegrity. So if we think of the human body, and the usual way we look at things is in terms of, um, well, first of all, tensegrity is tension plus integrity. Now, if we look at our own body, we think of rigid structures and lines of tension, the rigid structures being our bones and we think that they are supporting the muscles, the ligaments, and the tendons. If we get rid of the muscles, ligaments, and tendons, what happens to our bones? They all fall apart and they hit the ground. Right. So in other words, we have to look at the, the logic behind this. Now, if we're talking about the way that buildings are structured, we actually have a strong base, we build on that space, we put compression on that building, and it's a direct linear model, and uh, it works really well in terms of describing how much force we can actually put on a physical structure. Human beings don't quite work that way. An example of a building that exhibits tensegrity would be uh, a dome, for, such as the dome, geometric domes at the Expo or uh, out of Vancouver, uh, or the human body. Now, a way of explaining that is we'll use an analogy with a ball. Let's say this is someone's shoulder. And if I take a particular area and I start squeezing one area, or it could be the whole body, and I start squeezing one area, we apply a force. What happens to the rest of the ball here? It expands, right? Mm -hmm. Now, if I can push harder and harder and harder and harder until eventually an area ruptures over here, the area of rupture would be the weakest link in that ball. And yet, this is where we might exhibit we have an injury or a symptom, but is that actually the area that caused the problem? Mm -hmm. No. And that's a really simple analogy. But it's quite true for, we're talking about plantar fasciitis here, but for all conditions, quite often where we appear to have symptoms has nothing to do whatsoever with what the actual problem is. So this is a really, really important force in, in that tensional forces maintain our structural integrity. We just have to have one of those lines that's affected and the entire body will start to react to it. So these are the concepts and ideas that we put together and to try and develop our own program. Now, we've divided this in terms of a three-phase approach. So we've looked at plantar fasciitis and we said, what are the common connections? What are the common areas of the body, for example, that are affecting most people with plantar fasciitis? We've also said that every case is different. On the other hand, we don't want to take a person through a, a thousand different exercises and hope we cover everything. When we do this, we're going to get a person to start doing an exercise program. They'll involve stretching, strengthening, self myofascial release, so to basically break up restrictions within the body. And we'll have them do this for about four weeks. And what we found out over a period of time, in dealing with hundreds of cases of plantar fasciitis, close to 80% of people will actually get better. It could be, in some cases, obviously, we need a larger group to actually get some good data on it. We need thousands and thousands and thousands. So maybe it's 70%, maybe it's 80% but by far the majority of these people will get better. So as long as we get an 80% improvement, we'll have them do it for a few more weeks, and then if they're okay at that point, they're done. So in other words, they resolve this condition and it shouldn't come back to them. On the other hand, if they find they have not reached that level of improvement, then we'll go on to phase two. And in phase two, we'll take them through a whole bunch of biomechanical tests. These are self-biomechanical tests. Probably one of the important things I should have told you about this book. This is a self-help book. In other words, you don't need to necessarily see someone else to do the exercises in there. You can resolve your condition by going through the process of the three-phase process. Now, in the second phase, we have you go through certain biomechanical tests, checking to see if you're weak, you have weak hips, a weak core, different areas of the body. Then you would design, we use these tests to design your own specific individualized exercise program. So not the generic thing. So this way we can deal with a whole cross-section of different problems here. And we found that by far the majority of people actually will resolve their condition using this approach. 
Now, there's always going to be some people that won't get better. These are the people maybe they're overweight, they smoke too much, maybe they're under a lot of psychological stress, and then there's numerous variables. In those cases, they would move on to phase three, and I give them specific advice in terms of different practitioners from a multidisciplinary perspective who they could go see to achieve good results. Okay. So obviously every case is unique. <laughs> this book here, we've done our very best to show you how we can resolve your unique case. Some of you guys might have been down at uh, Comic-Con last week, so we were having a bit of fun down here this last week. Okay. So obviously we're treating a wide variety of people. Those were Brian's favorites. <laughs> oh, there were some of my favorites. <laughs> You know? Especially her. Feet, feet are different sizes, obviously, so we have to accommodate that. But the bottom line is, for a lot of people, they feel they can't resolve this condition. And you really can't. <clears throat> okay. So, thanks for coming and uh, celebrating with our book launch here. I really appreciate you coming out this evening.